So today I have with me on the Kuna Yoga podcast, Bernie Clark, um, a self-confessed yinster, a yin yoga uh, practitioner, and uh, also an incredibly knowledgeable anatomist and uh, yoga educator. So Bernie has written a whole bunch of books now. Um, the one that I'm reading at the moment is Your Yoga, Your Body, but it's a trilogy of uh, three books and and uh, also a book on yin yoga and I imagine probably other books as well, Bernie, is it? Is that covered all your <laughs> probably? <laughs> no, I've just written about six or seven Adam, yeah. but that'll do for now. <laughs> yeah. They're just incredible books, so you've got to read them if you haven't read them already. Um, and, and probably start. I mean, I, I'm starting with your yoga, your body, which is incredible, and I really recommend it to I, anyone. Your body, your yoga, but yeah. your body. Sorry, your body, your yoga. Oh, yeah, and then your body, your yoga, your body. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, great, a great book. And, uh, and today we're going to be talking, and because they're so um, wide ranging in their scope and, and so incredibly technical, um, but also practical, um, we're going to start and probably continue on the practical vein today, particularly on the uh, problem uh, that pertains to many Ashtanga practitioners, which is around the hip um, and around uh, the hip joint and what it does or doesn't do, because uh, let's be honest, many Ashtanga practitioners do end up suffering with uh, hip trouble um, and as long longer we go on the longer we find that sticking the leg behind the head isn't necessarily approachable or applicable to all bodies not even lotus posture so today i think um, we're going to talk a little bit about that bernie and uh, well that's uh, i've said my piece now <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> you take over you take over on the technical side <laughs> well thanks adam it's a pleasure to be on your your show and yeah the hip is um fascinating joint it's one of the biggest deepest joints in the body but it can't do everything people want it to do and i remember when i first started doing yoga in the 70s i was told the reason i couldn't do lotus is because i had western hips and if i just worked you know over 10 years i was told 10 years with the magic time i eventually built the yoga well i was i'm a type a yogi a for ashtanga but i thought i'm not going to wait 10 years so i put myself in lotus and I stayed there for a minute and I felt this incredible burning in my inner knees, but you know, no pain, no gain. So I stayed there. And when I came out, I basically tore the meniscus in both knees, the wow. medial meniscus on both sides, because I wasn't listening to my body. There. Right, right. Because usually people yeah. do it in movement. It's often done in, in, in the movement of getting in or getting out, but you were just in there and, yeah. and it, it just, right. And, and you were doing Ashtanga. No pain, no gain. Mention. Yeah, yeah. You actually, Bernie yeah. was actually an Ashtanga practitioner. He's from Vancouver. We were just discussing before yeah. we came on that we know uh, other Ashtanga teachers in common. And, and uh, right. And, and that was just well, that was the end of your Ashtanga career? Or? <laughs> no, I, uh, I started to bug every teacher I came across. I'd go to a conference and there would be David Light or Richard Freeman and I, Eric mm. Schiffman. I'd go up to all of them and say, what do you do for a torn meniscus? And they'd all look sad and say, oh, very bad. No blood supply into the cartilage there. So eventually I got the arthroscopic surgery. And I, I was always interested in anatomy. So I asked the, the surgeon if I could stay awake for the surgery because it's done with an arthroscopic yeah. probe, which one is I've a camera, it. one's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> one's the scissors, yeah. one's the vacuum cleaner. Yeah, so yeah. he let me stay awake and I got a nice tour yeah. of my knee and the kneecap and he yeah. showed me where there was incipient arthritis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in learning more and more about the anatomy, I realized I didn't have the hips for this. I should never have done that. There's no way I was ever going to be able to be comfortable in Lotus. I can do it mm. because I worked mm. on a lot of hip openers. Mm. But what was stopping me was not tension. You know, I owe Paul Grilly a lot of thanks for this, but he introduced me to the concept that there's two things that stop us from doing a pose. One is mm. a tensile resistance. One of our tissues just won't elongate enough, whether it's a muscle, a tendon, a ligament, a joint capsule. They're just too short or tight or whatever, and they won't give enough. And over time, that can be stretched out. Mm. But at some point, you reach the point where the body is now hitting the body. And in the hip socket specifically, at the femur, the femur, which is the leg bone, it's got an angle at the top, which has the head of the femur there. And this neck of the femur often comes into contact with the rim of the hip socket. And when those two bones hit, that's the end of the game. There's no way you can change the bones. Yoga is not going to change the bones. Braces won't change the bones. So mm. there's no way that tugging on this for a while is ever going to give you more range of motion. Mm. And so it's going to go down to the next joint in the chain, which is the knee. So mm. if the femur can't turn, the knee's got to turn. And that's when you do death and destruction yeah. to 
lateral ligaments yeah. and menisci and so forth. So what I was doing was trying to externally rotate my femur. The neck of the femur was hitting the rim of the hip socket. It couldn't go any further. So then I just cranked my foot up and I crushed the medial meniscus. Yeah. Learn the hard way. <laughs> Listen to your body. <laughs> yeah, I did the same as well. Um, both knees. Um, mm -hmm. One, I had the general and the other one I had the, uh, I was just a local anesthetic. And like you, I saw the whole process and uh, yeah, yeah, I kind of found it incredibly Absolutely. funny at the time because obviously you're, you're under, yeah, you know, you take, you have, you've got some kind of morphine or something in you. So, so I remember I was <laughs> quite high, quite high at the time as well, as he was showing me the joints and stuff, I was kind of laughing as he was soaring away, but um, it worked okay for me. I mean, obviously my hip, um, doesn't have that, that 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 problem that it you know I have obviously a little bit more range of moment and movement and I was able to get back yeah. into it in the end and I'm um, just to say for people listening because um it is an incredibly common injury in the yoga world and there's so many people out there that want to know what to do having basically torn meniscus whether they're you know whether that's diagnosed or, or still undiagnosed and right. work try to work on it and work around it like I mean would you I mean just as a kind of a slight sidebar really. Um, what do you, you know, do you have any advice there? Because many people think they can maybe work through it and, and heal that meniscus and, uh, you know, is that possible? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, well, two things. One is my little mantra is what stops me. So now whenever I'm in a pose and I can't go further, I keep asking myself what's stopping me. Mm. And the answer again, is either going to be tension or compression. It sounds binary, but it's actually a bit of a spectrum. If we want, we can get into that. But if it's tension and I can feel it, usually tension is in the direction away from the movement. So like a simple example, if I'm flexing my elbow, my wrist is coming towards my shoulder. If what's stopping me is tightness in the tricep, that's yeah. in the opposite direction. So if I'm feeling resistance here, that's tension. And over yeah. years of practice, I can stretch that out. But if I'm right. feeling it in front of the, the elbow, well, that's the cor coronoid process hitting the ulna and you just can't get there anymore and to try i'm just now going to break the bone or chip them off or damage the the joint capsule so if i know i'm what i'm stopped by is compression then right. that's it for that movement in that direction yeah so maybe by changing orientation of the hip socket i can get a few more extra degrees we can talk about that a little bit later if you're stopped by external rotation well the, the least amount of external rotation you have is when you're standing up when the hip is fully extended, because uh, I don't know Adam, how much detail you want me to get into, but yeah, the hip no, socket has an angle to it. Yeah, yeah. The hip socket has an angle to it. It's called the acetabular angle of abduction, AAA. Yeah. The acetabulum is the Latin name for the hip socket. There's yeah. an angle of abduction, which is moving the leg up to the side. Yeah. Some people have it almost vertical. Some people have it closer to horizontal. That means that the the acetabulum is actually on a slant. And when I'm standing up straight and I'm trying to externally rotate the femur in the hip socket, the back of the neck of the femur will eventually hit the back rim of the hip, hip socket. But if I flex the hip more, that gives me more room to externally rotate. So you have more room for external rotation when you're sitting because your hips are 90 degree flexed. You even have more room if you flex even more. So the more you flex the hip, the more room you have for external rotation. Right. And when you do that pose in Ashtanga, what is it? The standing half lotus well, pose. Yeah, I, I, I was exactly thinking of that. It doesn't make any sense then to have it, you know, I mean, originally it was at the end, you know that, right? Originally that position was at the end of the primary no, series. It didn't but yeah, it was, it was, it would make some more sense there then from what you're saying than having it at the start, you're putting a lotus in when you're standing rather than having it on the ground yeah. when it's easy yeah. Yeah, to get. But if you're doing the sitting version where the hips are flexed 90 degrees, yeah. You yeah. may be able to do the half lotus right. on that side okay. pretty easily, but stand yeah. up and suddenly, no, I can't do it. And of course, right. to bind, a lot of people bend, they flex the hips yeah. so they can grab yeah. the foot behind the back and that yeah. gives them more external rotation, but then they straighten up again. And that's where now the femur gets stuck and the stress goes into the knee. Right. So that is all yeah. due to the fact that our acetabular, the acetabulum have this angle to it. And you'll find the more you can flex, you can see this in other poses like butterfly or whatever. You bring your feet together, the knees are way up. But as you bring your chest forward, the knees start to lower down. Because yeah, now they're yeah. kind of sliding up the angle of the hip socket. Yes, now there's yes. more room to externally rotate. But when you sit back up again, up pop the knees. 
just to go and backtrack for a second, how many, I mean, what percentage of people do you, would you say, I mean, if you could give a percentage that the, the Lotus posture would not be relevant for then? Oh, I think the Lotus posture is what I call a high risk, low reward pose. It's a high risk for most people. Yeah. But right. a lot of yoga is self-selecting. I mean, the Ashtangis are Ashtangis because they can do it. Most people yes. who can't do primary series, they quit within six months because they just can't yes. do these you know, amazing poses. So they fail out. And a lot of the teachers think, well, they just were quitters, not realizing the reality of human variation. Most people, 90% mm. of the people don't have the hips to do Lotus. Mm. But if they keep trying, it's just going to screw up their knees or into their ankles or, or give it a labral tear because the hip bone itself is covered by a circular rim of cartilage called the labrum. And if you keep forcing the neck of the femur against the back of the hip socket, eventually you just tear, tear the labrum there. So most people won't be able to do Lotus. So are there cultural variations as well? Do you think it's more of a you know, Western thing that, that, you know, there's the tightness in the hips rather than having an, in a tradition of Eastern movement where these Lotus stuff, and you look at, I mean, obviously you look at him, you know, still even to this day, less so now than it was before, but, you know, Indian sitting on the floor, Lotus for most uh, Indian bodies hasn't been a problem. You know? Well, I'm not sure about that. I, I've okay. been to India dozens of times, but never in a yoga context. In my previous life, I was uh, in the high tech space industry, and I used to spend a lot of time in India with the Department of Space. And, and the people I dealt with, they, they didn't have much more flexibility than I did. They right. were businessmen. They were sitting mm -hmm. in chairs, too. And, right. you know, people maybe in the streets and the servants and so forth, they didn't have chairs. They, they sat on the floor. That mm -hmm. may have predisposed them. But still, so even then, it... you had to have the right hips for it. Right. So there's no now, squatting general, is generalizations you could make with culture or anything like that. Because you do, well, we do know that... um, variations of Polynesian, you said, I have a longer uh, end of the, the hip or something like that. I'm no good with anatomy. But, yeah. Well, one good example is the, the femur itself. The neck of the femur has an angle. Yes. It's mm. called the neck shaft angle. And that's important if we're doing Samakanasana, the splits, the sideways splits. If you notice, if you bring the femur up, notice how the top of the femur, if you feel the outside of your hips, that big bulgy, bony thing, some people call that the hip, some people call, call the top of the pelvis the hip. It's anatomically not a good term. This is called your greater trochanter. And as you do a, a split, a side split, eventually the greater trochanter starts to hit the side of the pelvis or it squishes the muscles in between there, the mm -hmm. gluteus medius and minimus, and they get trapped in there. Now, if that angle is very obtuse, you have a lot more room to go before you get a compression. But if it's much more acute, like it's coming in from right in a 90 degree angle, you can't spread your legs apart very much at all before the bones hit. Now, culturally, if you're growing up in a more primal environment where you're, as a child, you're out in the fields helping your parents and agriculture, when we're babies, that neck is almost horizontal or vertical rather. But as you start to crawl and walk, this is still all cartilage. It hasn't become bone yet until you're past puberty. You're bending that cartilage. And as the bone comes in over your maturation period, the angle of the neck of the femur gets more acute. So people who grew up more in primal cultures, they can't abduct their legs as much. But kids mm. who grew up in, in like Boston, where they're mm. in school all day, and they're sitting watching TV the rest of the day, and they don't really move around, their femur, it's their neck angle is quite high. And so mm. those people can split, do the splits a lot. So that's one case where culture will affect your range of motion. Mm. But once you're it's through puberty, the bones aren't gonna change, barring an accident think, or a disease. It's kind of the opposite though, wouldn't you, in a way that someone who's got a kind of more mobile, more you know, physical upbringing would be able to have more range of movement, not, you know, not less in it, you know? <laughs> In other joints, yes, like they would be able to squat better because right. they've been training their ankles to dorsiflex more. Mm -hmm. And there's also a bony connection. I don't have a foot with me, but this is the bottom of the tibia. This is called the tibial plafond. On top of the foot, there's a bone called the talus bone. And some mm -hmm. people, it's just the shape of that knob on the talus doesn't allow them to bend dorsiflex the foot very much. They get stopped very easily and they wonder why they can't do squat or they can't bring their heels down and down dog because the bones mm. are hitting. But other right. people that grew up squatting all the time, 
it may change the shape of the bones as they mature so that definitely in India, people squat easier than in the West mm. Mm. because of the shape of the bones. But that doesn't right. mean they can do lotus more easily than the West. Right. That's interesting. I mean, I, I kind of presumed it was some cultural predisposition, but you think it's just simply the fact of chairs and, um, you know, the, the tightness in the hips through just sitting in chairs. Yeah. There's a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Stuart McGill. He's a fairly well-known yeah. spine biomechanic. He Probably. talks about different types of hip sockets. I, mm. I talked about this angle of abduction, but he mm. also likes to refer to the anteversion and retroversion. And he says mm. there's a Celtic hip and a more Eastern European hip. And you huh. find a lot of the big weightlifters who need to have that really deep squat to get to the bar and then lift it up. They tend to have hip sockets that are more retroverted, pointing out to the side. And that allows them to get really deep down because it allows more of the external rotation needed. Whereas the Celtic hip, like the Scotsman, they don't, yeah. you don't see too many Scotsmen winning big Olympic weightlifting champions, but they toss the Kyber. They're, they're doing things in a more forward movement because their hip sockets are more forward. So if you think of somebody like Usain Bolt, fast runner, yeah. Or, yeah. or some bicycle, bicyclist champion, their hip sockets are more facing forward because their knees have to go forward when they're pedaling. You don't want the knees way up to the side. Yeah. But a hockey player, when they skate, we push out to the side on the ice. So we need the, the hips more externally rotated. So the best hockey players are not great sprinters or cyclists but there'd be better weightlifters and, and right. power skaters because of where the hip socket is facing. Mm. Now for an Ashtangi, mm. we want the hip socket to be retroverted out to the side so you can bring the foot behind your head. Mm. But if you happen to have these antiverted hip sockets, there's no way you're ever going to bring your foot behind your head. Mm. I mean, it's so refreshing to hear because as you said at the start, a lot of it is like is self-selecting, but there, there's, there's still this kind of this narrative within the yoga community and certainly in the Ashtanga community. Well, if you know, you just have to practice hard enough. You just have to want it enough or, or be disciplined enough or be committed enough or be devoted even, right? Like if you, if you just get your ego out of the way or something, or, you know, like yes. then somehow you can, uh, you can get over your limitations. I mean, so it's a fantastic, uh, conversation to be having. I mean, when you talk about practice, um, all is coming. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk no, about the, sorry, the what, no. yeah, the what's stopping me, and I, I think it's fantastic as a, to break it down to what exactly is stopping me. And uh, how do you know what feeling to to? How do you know what feeling to respond to? Right, because you also talk about creep, the possibility that you know yeah. you can develop some some flexibility in the joint capsule, um, and so so some and some degree ligaments. And I got this from you that a ligament stretch or a stretch of the ligament isn't always always a bad thing, right? But no. on the other hand, there's some stretches that obviously, or some feelings in the body that you do want to be think you know kind of wary of. Like, a, can you have you got anything to say about yeah. you know what what kind of sensations yeah. one should trust and what sensations one should back off from? Well, you've got my book. If you ever look on page 21 of Your Body, Your Yoga, there's a, a table, which on one, one side of the table is the what stops me spectrum. We mm. have tension and compression, but tension has different feelings and compression has different degrees. And then I've got sensations and then I've got pain. So it's a table of what would a stretch feel like in the muscle? And what would pain feel like in the muscle? And what would compression feel like there's three types of compression. There's soft, which is when you bring your heel to your buttock. That could be a soft, squishy sort of feeling where your calf is hitting the back of your thigh. And you can usually push more into that. So that gives you an idea. And well, it's in the direction of movement. My heel is going to my buttock. So that gives me an idea that it's compression and it's soft. So I could probably push in a bit deeper. Medium is when the bone is hitting the flesh. And this happens a lot for people in lunges dragons and leaning forward and warriors where the top of the hip, which is called the ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine, starts to pinch onto the top of the femur. And a lot of people hate that feeling, but because the alignment cue is the knee must be straight ahead, they get that pinchy feeling. If they just mm. let the knee go out to the side a bit, now they mm. go around that and it's no longer mm. compression stopping them. Mm. The third type of compression is bone on bone. When you open up your elbow, as wide as you can, what stops you is that hard stuck feeling right there at the bone. Mm -hmm. So you have three sort of forms of compression. 
each one with very different sensations. Mm. And in the other direction, tension, well, it depends whether it's tension in the skin, that's trivial, maybe one or 2%. It could be tension in the fascial bags that wrap the whole body. It could be tension in the muscles and tendons. It could be tension in the ligaments, or it can be tension in the joint capsule. All of these have different sensations. But one of the things that stops a lot of us, if you, the first time, if you can remember that far back when you did a forward fold before you did any yoga, you first time to touch the toes. Yeah. Well, there's some people who've just got the body for it and they just flop down on the floor without doing a day of yoga. But most people, their hands are about a foot away from their toes. And if you ask them what's stopping them, they'll look up at you and say, fine. No, no, no. What are you feeling? What are you feeling here? They have no idea. They're not trained to look inside. Mm. They have no interoception. So part mm. of, I think, the role of us as teachers is, I call them flying lessons. Everybody's body is like an airplane. And the controls are different from every airplane. There's Cessnas and Boeings. And you're giving flying lessons. You're not in the air with the person. You have to talk them down. But they mm. have to take responsibility for landing their plane. So you have to give them flying lessons. So what's stopping you? I have no idea. Well, you're moving this way. Do you feel anything in the back side of the body? And they look off in the distance and say, yeah. <laughs> okay, what is it? Is it in one place or is it spread out? Now, normally when you're doing a forward fold, you feel it all along the back of the legs and along the spine. Well, mm. that's kind of a myofascial thing. There's a whole spread out sensation there, which can tell you that it's not just one joint. It's not just one ligament. It's the myofascial train, the anatomy trains of Tom Myers. Mm. And over time, you, you have to kind of work on that. But if it wasn't just in one place, maybe it's just in the belly of the hamstring. Okay, that's telling you, okay, it's right into that muscle. So it's not myofascia. It might be right into that muscle. And for some reason, that's tight. Now, part of the book is, well, why is it tight? It can be short. Mm. It could be an overactive nervous system. It could be the immune system. Uh, when you get colds and flus, you feel tight. That's the immune system affecting the fascia. It could be hormonal. We know that women through certain points of their, their moon cycle, their, their fascia is softer and weaker, and sometimes it's stiffer and harder, which is why women have four times more ACL tears than men because of the hormonal mm -hmm. thing. Right. We know our fascia has mm -hmm. cannabinoid receptors. And so there's a whole bunch of things that could be the answer of why do I have tension here? It's not just short, tight muscles, although mm. it could be short, mm. tight muscles. That is also mm. a possibility. Mm. So you have to pay attention to the sensations in your body. And I wish I could just say by looking at somebody, you'll know what's stopping them, but you can't. Yeah. You have to, they're flying the plane. They have to report back to you what the cockpit is telling them. I think, yeah, was it, I think it's your book where you say the difference between, uh, you know, uh, someone working, you know, in, in this capacity and, and a pilot is that the pilot's in the right. plane with you, you know, and I think it's, <laughs> it's something yes. to bear in mind, isn't it? The, the, you know, the teacher can say all these things and obviously they're always prescribing from their own experience because you, that's all you can really do in a way, right? And, to, and well, to degrees, right? That's, that's what, yeah. until you have, you try and kind of have more, you know, objectivity or, you know, o over these instructions and start to realize that yes you feel it this way but it doesn't mean that you know everyone else is going to have that same feeling you know but uh yeah they're not in your so it starts with asking plane. them yeah 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 right yeah, yeah i do the analogy of the doctor and an airplane pilot and what's the difference between the right. doctor and airplane pilot and basically it comes down to both of them are supposed to go through a whole checklist of things before like when a doctor sees you he's got a checklist of things that he wants to talk to you about but he's only got 10 minutes so he mm. basically ignores that and just asks you a few questions but a pilot, they also have their checklist and they go through the whole checklist. They take the time before they even taxi away from the, the terminal because they're on the plane. It's in their best interest to check this out. So we are more like doctors, not pilots. We're not sitting there in the plane with the, the student. So best is to teach them how to fly their plane. And you're right, it, it's not perfect because some people have such poor, poor interoception, they have no idea what they're feeling. Mm. But that's your job is to teach them, give them a whole list of things. Well, is it this, is it that? Is it in one spot? Is it deep? Is it superficial? Is it spread out? Does it have a shape? Is it hot? Is it cool? Is it burning? Does it have a tingly feeling to it? Now, if somebody had told me way back when I started, anything that's sharp, tingly, electrical, burning, stabbing, is not good, come out, I wouldn't have stayed in Lotus with that burning feeling in my knees. Yeah. But I was still under the old idea of no pain, no gain.
which I yeah. understand if you translate into Sanskrit is rendered bullshit to he. <laughs> That's good. It's a Canadian joke for you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> no, I liked it. Um, yeah, I, I think the narrative has changed, hasn't it? I think that at least, you know, like it is starting to change that this idea that you can suffer yes. through things is, you know, luckily is starting to change. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you make a fantastic, well, many points. I mean, one of them is that, yes, I mean, basically the student still has to be their own guide because you're on your plane and it's your plane and, you know, no one really cares about your plane like you do, you know, right? Right. Even, even the teacher, because they're not actually in your body, right? And another thing, right. obviously, you, you kind of touch upon is that, yes, yoga is self-selecting. I, you know, this, I think I recently got my hands on this self-selecting idea, I think from inspired by you. And it is utterly important here because you've got teachers who can do this stuff, right? And they're prescribing yeah. to people who anatomically, anatomically are limited, right? Um, and if you can just do it, you just, you just can't understand. Like, I mean, you know, until maybe you also get older or injured, like, you know, <laughs> you know, in the, inevitably. <laughs> well, yeah, a good simple example of that is just palm pronation. You know, if you have your mm. palms up, it's called supination. Turn your palms down is pronation. Well, the average person cannot pronate from the elbow 180 degrees. So in order to get their palms flat in down dog or plank pose or handstand, or all those times we need palms on the floor in yoga, they have to pronate 180 degrees, but they can't. So if they can't, then they have to turn the shoulders. It has to come from the shoulders. But then the teacher comes along and says, no, bring your shoulders back and down. But now your palms aren't flat. I'm sure you've seen yeah. people with tent hands. They're doing down dog, but the base of the first finger is up in the air. I've right. seen one teacher yes. adjust that by stepping on it. Well, that oh, just yeah. puts all the stress into the shoulder. I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. advise that uh, adjustment. Well, most of the people can't do that. But then the teacher comes up and says, no, no, watch like me and puts her palms yeah. flat, shoulders down. And then we try it. This comes up in sphinx pose. When you have your elbows on the floor or pinch marasana and mm. your palms are flat and the teachers want mm. the forearms to be parallel. And mm. somebody gets their palms flat and the elbows go to the side. And they mm. say, no, no, elbows in. No, but palms mm. flat. No, but elbows mm. in, you're not listening. Watch like this. And the guy can't do it. So the teacher says, look, breathe, ujjayi. Let's have a little mula bandha. No, palms flat, elbows in. No, it's still not working. So they get the strength. So they still have the elbows so they can't go wide. And now they try to force the palms down. Well, the palms won't go. And if you force them, you're just going to break the wrist because that's the shape of their, their ulna and their radius. They just hit when they pronate. Some mm -hmm. people have big ulnas and big radius and they don't have that range of motion. They'll never get their palms flat without bending the elbows or moving the shoulders. But because the teacher can do it and the teacher thinks, well, everyone's just like me. I read an anatomy book and they all showed the same picture. So we think everyone's like the, the pictures in the anatomy books, not realizing that those pictures are averages of hundreds of cadavers. It's a composite, nobody actually looks like that. But we got this idea, this mental map that everyone looks like that skeleton hanging in the corner and that we all should be able to do this. That ignores human variation. We, mm. Nobody is average. So most of the people cannot get their palms flat. Most of the people cannot externally rotate their hips, bring their feet behind their head, or come into lotus pose. These are high risk, low reward poses. Mm. So but those who can, somebody, great. Yeah. What about someone who says, well, you know, I practice and I, and I couldn't put my leg anywhere near my head and now I can, you know, what's going on there? That's and, tension. And, and how, right. How much is there? How much of this creep is there? How much possibly possibility to develop and to get more flexible is there? Yeah. Well, that's a hypothetical. It depends on the person. I was doing a Steinger for maybe three or four years before I started doing yin yoga. And one of the poses I had a lot of trouble with was Prasarita Padottanasana. I couldn't get my head to the floor and I couldn't do the splits like this. Now, what was stopping me was not compression. I hadn't reached the end of my range of motion. It was tension. So tension in this case is in the adductor muscles. And trying to get the legs further out and i was just tight there now even though i was doing ashtanga six days a week for years i still wasn't getting through all that tension but after adding yin yoga to my class where i was sitting in straddle fold for five minutes at a time i started to stretch out the fascial tissues it wasn't that my muscles are short and tight it was the fascia enveloping it and after three months of yin yoga my head was on the floor 
three years of Stanga and my head wasn't on the floor, but three months of yin. Mm. So what was stopping me was the tension. And I, I got to work through that tensile resistance until now, I know I'm stopped by compression because I feel it. If I try to yeah. bring my legs any further out, I'm not feeling mm. it in the inner legs anymore. I'm feeling it right up there at the top of the femur. And I can feel that, okay, I'm hitting here. I just can't get any further. Now, if you do this little test, you do a standing splits, you'll get your legs so far apart. If you then forward fold, mm. again, you change the orientation of the femur to the hip socket. Now you can get a few more degrees of abduction. So your legs will never be as far apart when you're standing splits as if you do the seated splits or the proseritas because you're changing the angle of the bones. Mm. So that's how I can tell I, I can get stuck here. But if I do this, now I'm getting tension. Now I can go a bit further until I get stuck again in a new place. Mm. How long it takes to get rid of that tension depends on you. And I like to call it your biography and your biology. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have a genetic condition called Erlo-Danlos. It's where the collagen in their fascia is more elastic than normal people. And they are naturally very flexible. But they too go to where the bones hit. They mm. just go to where the bones hit day one of doing yoga because they're naturally so flexible there. But those type of people, the ones that have to be worried about going too far and maybe popping the bone out of the joint. Mm. So in that case, mm. you don't want to go past where you feel compression. But most of us, we're stopped by tension. We work through that and eventually we're stopped by compression. And the tension is in the joint capsule and the fascia? Or, I mean, can you say anything about different types of tension or anything? Because I mean, these days in the yoga world, there's this idea yeah. of hypermobility and the worry about stretching tendons and ligaments that you, you know, you're overstretching and this is dangerous, right? Um, and then even one doctor said to me that you can't stretch muscles, which seems a bit strange because some mm -hmm. muscles are kind of shorter and, and tighter, right? And you can stretch muscles out. So can you say anything about stretching, you know, It'd be very useful. Yeah, it is a controversial area. And mm. in my, my, what stops me question, my mantra, what stops me, as I said, there's two answers, tension mm. or compression. I mentioned mm. there's three types of compression, soft, medium, hard. There's also about five different types of tension. As I said, at the trivial level, there's the tension of your skin. Let's suppose you had a, an accident, you have some scar tissue in your skin, that will resist a bit. And then there's tension in the myofascia. Now, you're wearing a shirt like me. If you hold your, sorry, just bring your right arm up and notice how easy you can move that right arm. Now, hold down on the lower right part of your, your shirt. Hold yeah. it down as far as it can go. Now bring your yeah. arm up. And notice you're stuck. Right. You can't bring this yeah. high. Well, yeah. that, but you can see that line in your shirt, that's a myofascial line. Let's suppose I had an appendix taken out or a C-section or ovary work done and I've got some scar mm. tissue there. Now I can't mm. move. It's nothing to do with muscles. It's just this myofascial connection line has got some scar tissue somewhere, some adhesion. And now I can't move as much as I used to. So there's another answer to what stops me. It could be myofascial. It could be the muscle itself. Muscles can be elongated. It's called sarcomere genesis. In weightlifting, we add muscle on top of muscle. Sarcomeres on top of sarcomeres, so they get thicker and bigger. In yoga, we tend to add them in series at the end, so we get them longer and longer. But definitely, you can make your muscles longer through sarcomere genesis. But also, if you don't use the muscles, they start to atrophy. The body recycles the sarcomeres we're not using. Just like if you don't weightlift anymore, your body starts to reabsorb the muscle it created. So yeah, definitely muscles can be another answer. But muscles are encased in a bag of fascia. Like if you go to the store before you're a vegetarian and you bought a hot dog wiener, you might have bought a string of eight of them and they'll have these fascial bags around them. Well, the fascia is a lot stiffer than the muscle. Mm. And that could be what's stopping you. In fact, there was an experiment they did once where they cut a muscle out of the body and they just stretched the muscle fiber itself. And it could stretch about two and a half times its resting length before it ruptured. But if they actually try that inside the body, where it's still in the fascial bag, they can only stretch it about one and a half times. And the difference is the fascial bag that's enveloping the muscle is resisting the muscle elongating further. So it could mm. be muscle fascia, but it could also be the tendon. The tendons are meant to stretch a little bit. And this is a, a thing that a lot of people don't believe at first. Tendons, ligaments are designed to stretch. They're elastic. 
more than the muscle. When you stretch a muscle and you let it go, it doesn't snap back quickly. You kind of have to contract the muscle to reduce it again. But a tendon, we have some of the most elastic tendons and fascia of any animal. No other primate like us can jump and run. We, yeah. Our tendons are like kangaroos and, and gazelles, especially your Achilles tendon. On the average per person, the Achilles tendon can stretch about 7%, and then it snaps back, and that gives us our leaping power. But in some people, it can stretch 17%. Hmm. In a chimpanzee, it can only stretch 3%. So we definitely load. It's like a stiff spring. When you stretch a stiff spring, it snaps back really forcefully. If you stretch a very loose spring, it doesn't snap back very much. So our ligaments and tendons are meant to be stiff springs. That's why some clinicians call them your ham springs, not your ham strings, because that's why we flex their hips. If I'm going to jump up to dunk a basketball, I first mm. bend down. I'm loading up the springs, and then I release. Mm. That's not coming from your glutes. That's not coming mm. from your hamstring muscles. It's coming from the tendons and the fascia. And they're, they're being loaded up, they're stretching a little bit, and then they release and you get this kinetic energy. Mm. So some loose tissues can be tighter than average. And that could be another reason that stops us. The muscles can be contracted. The muscles are controlled by the nerves. And some people are very tonic. Normally, like my bicep, I've got maybe 15% of the muscles activated, and that gives me a certain muscle tone. But some people have a condition called contracture, and they may have 25% of the muscle fibers always contracted, and that mm. restricts their range of motion. Mm. Some people get this in the hands. They can never open up their hands because their contracture is so high. Mm. So there are ways to trick the nervous system to lower that tone. Mm. There's uh, little organs in the tendon where the tendon becomes a muscle called Golgi tendon organs. And mm. these are measuring the amount of stress in this area. Because this, because it's not quite muscle, not quite tendon, it's one of the weak points. And most tears happen there. So these little cells, they're measuring the strength there. And if they think you're going to get torn, they send a signal to the spinal cord. It doesn't even go to the brain. And it says, relax all your muscles. You've probably seen this if you ever watched two guys hand wrestling, arm wrestling. Yeah, right. And see how that ends? Yeah, it's not a yeah. slow decay to the table. One guy just gives out all of a sudden. Yeah. That's because yeah. the pressure is getting so much in his elbow that he's about to tear his, his ligaments here, his tendon. Huh. So right. the muscle just says, give up. And then you have no conscious control over that. Right. So our nervous right. system is creating tension and it can downgrade it and it can upgrade it. So there's another answer to what stops me. Another answer is how much water you have and the nature of water. Our fascia is, is bags of water. It's like bubble wrap, but not bubble wrap with air, bubble wrap with water in it. And sometimes that water, most of the time, it's in a gel state, like jello. But if you add heat to it, or you do a lot of movement, or you warm up, you do some stretching, that gel state becomes liquid. And it mm. becomes, they call it the soul state. And with that mm. liquid state, now things move, which is what we do in a yin yoga class. We hold the pose for four or five minutes, and the water state changes. And that gives you this sense of, oh, I can feel that release. I can now go to the next edge and the next minute. Mm. The clinicians call that the relaxation response inside the, the tissue. So there's so many different answers to this question of what stops me. Mm. Tension can come in many different flavors and varieties. How much is it reasonable, though, to stretch a joint, to stretch the tendons and ligaments of a joint? I mean, as opposed to having well, some kind of ten tension and holding that joint together, right? Because oftentimes it seems that flexibility is stressed in yoga to, you know, way out of balance to the strength aspect of holding the body together, you know, being being strong in the, in, yeah. in the body. Yeah. We need yin and yang. We need stirum and sukham. You need both. I think we overemphasize mobility at the cost of stability. Like I was in my Ashtanga days, I wanted to do drop back to wheel. I don't have mm. the spine for it, but I, I wanted to do it. And yet once I met Stuart McGill and studied with him for a bit, he, he kept saying, no, no, no. Your spine is designed first and foremost for stability. Mobility is a secondary function of the spine. You have your upper body and the spine connects it to your lower body. So when you see somebody running like Usain Bolt, he's moving his mm. arms really powerfully. Mm. Now, how's that affecting mm. his legs? Well, through mm. the stiffness of the spine. If his spine was moving all over the place, there's mm. no way he'd be able to run very fast. 
So you need to stiffen your core so you can transfer forces from upper to lower and lower to upper. Once you've got that, then you can work on some mobility. But how much mobility do we really need to live our daily life? I, mean, mm. I need enough to be able to turn around and back at my car. I need to be able to look both ways crossing the street. I need to be able to swing my golf club. But I don't need to bring my hands backwards and grab my ankles. That, that is no functional health benefit to that. Well, I think of it as a curve. I call it the anti-fragility curve. Imagine like a side of a mountain. You start at the base where there's no stress and there's no health. And then you start to stress the tissue, any tissue, your immune system, your nervous system, your, your muscles, your ligaments, your joint capsules, your bone, all need stress to stay healthy. But if you mm. get to the top of the mountain and you keep going, you're going to fall off the cliff. Mm. So you can have too much stress. But you can mm. also have too little stress. So mm. we need to find the Goldilocks position, just mm. the right amount. Yeah. Now, bones and cartilage, they react very well to compression. We can grow bone, Stuart McGill calls it, you can callous the bones by compressing them. So weightlifters over their years of practice, they've calloused their spine and they've built huge thick bones there that can take this huge compression of a thousand pounds lifted over their head. Mm. And the same with the cartilage between the discs. They built that up through compression. But almost all the other tissues, like our muscles, our ligaments, our tendons, our joint capsules, they're stimulated through tension. So you need to put a tensile stress into all these tissues, including your joint. But not too much. You don't want to go over the cliff, but not mm. nothing either. Mm. People make this binary. I see so many people saying it's bad to stretch your ligaments, so never stretch your ligaments. I'm saying, mm. no, no, it's bad to overstretch your ligaments. Don't overstretch them. Well, how am I going to know? It's going to hurt. <laughs> if your body is telling you, don't do this, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. never do nothing because that's just going to make yeah. it atrophy and get weaker. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a very salient point in the book. And, and yeah, with the Goldilocks principle that you have to stress the body, but there is a happy medium. And I guess the difficulty is that the, that happy medium is also always shifting as well. As one gets used yeah. to a feeling of stress, there's this constant fear and encouragement to kind of keep pushing the one's edge, right? So the stress gradually creeps to be greater and greater as one gets used to it in a way as well, which I suppose is the danger yeah. of it, that you, you, you gradually lose your perspective. Well, eventually in yoga, we tend to work through the tension, work through the tension until we get to the end, which is compression. Mm. Mm. And if we didn't realize we've now reached the end, we keep trying to go further. And that's when mm. you're going to damage the joint. Trying to go mm. past your end range of motion is when death and destruction occurs. It's okay to keep working to end range of motion because that's when the bones are going to hit and the bones are going to get thicker and stronger. You need that. Mm. But once you can recognize, okay, I've reached my limit, I don't have to go further. And if that limit is my foot's not behind my head, then okay, in this lifetime, my foot's not going to go behind my head. Maybe in my next lifetime, I'll come back as an acrobat or something contortionist, but not right now. So work through your tension, but once you feel, okay, what's stopping me now is compression, that's it. You've maxed out. Yeah, yeah. I know people are going to want to hear more about what's stopping them putting their leg behind their head. Can you say anything else about this that I'm forgetting? I mean, there's obviously there's, you, yeah. you, you mentioned the joint capsule being tense. There's some degree of stretch that one can develop, right? That, you know, yeah. some people. Yeah, can. tension until you get to the point of the bones hitting. Mm -mm. You've got capsular ligaments here now there's mm. a whole bunch of ligaments and they're they're actually diagonally shaped which is kind of interesting we're designed to flex the foot and as you flex the foot because of the nature of the alignment of the capsule ligament that joint capsule becomes slack until mm. you get past like 90 degree angle and then it starts to tighten up again we're not mm. designed to bring the foot behind us too much so leg mm. extension you'll find most people can't extend their leg very far maybe 30 degrees but they can flex the leg up to 90 degrees, 100 degrees, some guys 140 degrees. And that's due to the tension in the capsule ligaments. So you'll see people doing splits or the back leg in say uh, pigeon pose. They can't extend that leg back very farther. So what they do is they kind of cheat by tilting the pelvis mm, and make it mm. look like the back leg is now horizontal. Mm, mm, mm. But they just, mm -hmm. the, the rim of the hip socket is being hit by the neck of the femur and the more you mm. try to turn that femur, it's just pushing the pelvis over. So now yes. you think, and that's why the hips aren't level in pigeon pose, because yeah. that back leg yeah. can't go straight. Yeah. So yeah, there is tension that stops us from bringing that foot behind mm -hmm. the head. 
But once you get through all that tension, external rotation is going to be stopped by the neck of the femur hitting the rim of the hip socket. And now that's hard to feel because it's a very small area between the tension side and the compression side. It's only about an inch. And there's not a lot of nerve endings in that part of the hip because it would hurt to walk. So most people can, can't even feel what's stopping them from flexing their elbow. To try to figure out what's stopping me from really externally yeah. rotating my hip, that's going to mm. be a mystery to most people. Mm. There, I would just say, why do you want to bring your foot behind your head? <laughs> what's your intention in that pose? If it's aesthetics, just realize you're taking a risk. If it's functional, mm. Mm. Now, I need it because I need to be able to turn my hips enough to swing a golf club or to be able to get out of the bathtub or get in and out of a car. That's functional. If it's aesthetic mm. because it looks cool to bring both feet yeah. behind your head, well, I'd like you to rethink that. Is it worth maybe risking walking for the rest of your life? Yes. Is it simply the hip joint or is there anything to do with the sacrum that's involved in this process? No, some people joint, used to yeah. think that the sacrum, mm. they used to think if you're pushing the femur into the mm -hmm. ilium, the side of the thing there, you're compressing the sacrum. No, mm. no you're, you're not. You can't mm. compress the sacrum. You can't decompress the sacrum because whatever you're doing to one side, it just gets transferred to the other side. So I wouldn't worry about that so much. I would worry okay. about people who are destabilized already, like someone who's already had a couple of babies and the cartilage, the sacroiliac joint is both fibrous and synovial. And as we get older, it becomes more and more fibrous and less synovial. Women need a little bit of movement here because when mm. the baby has to come through the birth canal, you need for that to open up a bit. You need mm. for the pubis symphysis to weaken. And that's why they have these hormones relax and that softens up these joints. Now that could stay too loose. And so they have to be a little bit careful. But that's mostly of asymmetric stresses around the DSI joints. I don't think that's going to be affected by external rotation because that's going to push the bones into each other, not pull them apart. Most people, they're not meant to have a lot of range of motion here. Two millimeters. In the sacrum. That's in not very much area. in the right, sacrum. Right. So there's not so much to do with the sacrum. I'm thinking about something like no. Utkatasana, you know, you know, the um, chair posture, Utkatasana. Yeah. And, and the idea of dropping the tailbone and movement in the sacrum. I mean, you got any ideas about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a slight movement, as I said, two millimeters. If the top mm. of the sacrum goes forward, it's called nutation. If the top of mm. the sacrum goes backwards, it's called counter nutation. Now, there's mm. a lot of controversy about which is the best way for it to move. I would say that's so tiny, you won't notice. You won't even feel it. So it, it's just some people have done the studies in the 1950s. You can't do these studies anymore because they're not ethical. This one guy, he, he put into people's bones little metal ball bearings, tiny little ball bearings. And he put them in the ilium and inject them in the bone, the painful thing. And then he x rayed people in the different postures. And he found that about 50%, or maybe it's in the book, but uh, maybe it was 70% of people, when they do a forward fold, the sacrum mutates. But 20% of it, the counter mutates. And 10%, it doesn't move. So to say that, you know, when you do this movement, you're mutating the pelvis or mutating the sacrum. Maybe. It depends on the person. There's human variations here, too. And even if you are or you aren't, so what? It's such a tiny movement that I wouldn't really worry about it. Now, if you mm. have pain there and you have some mm. pathological problems there, like your, your range of motion is like 15 millimeters, not two, well, then you've got a problem. You've got to see a physical therapist about and how do you stabilize that? Mm. Well, you have to somehow exercise it, but you have to do it in a way that's not going to make the range of motion greater. This is mm. why Stuart McGill says stability first and foremost, mobility second. I'm not sure if I to totally answered that, that question. Or not. No, well, it's a complicated answer, but, you know, I mean, yes, I, uh, well. Yeah. Um, and now I'm thinking about the idea of cueing the hips. And you mentioned an, 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 in the book, I remember, uh, you know, about leveling the hips or talking about a basin of water and trying not right. to tip over that basin of water, right? And then different, maybe less functional ideas of, of, of yoga teachers cueing the hips, right? Can you mention, say something? Yeah, about that? that's, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen a pelvis. A lot of people, if they look at a pelvis, they kind of hold it so that the, the front of the iliums are, are horizontal. 
Mm. But that's not the way that it is in the body. This is leveling the pelvis. But I've had to do a huge posterior tilt. This is the way the pelvis is. It right. kind of comes to the peak and it goes down sharply off each side. Now, what is neutral? Well, a lot of people depend on the spine. As you anteriorly tilt your pelvis, you're creating more of a back bend. If you mm. posteriorly tuck the pelvis, you're straightening the lumbar spine. So mm. you can't look at the pelvis without looking at the lumbar spine. And what's neutral for a lumbar spine? Well, it depends on the facet joints, depends on the shape of the vertebra. And again, there's huge human variations there too. So to actually just say what is neutral for the pelvis, short of getting an x-ray, you can't tell. And a lot of teachers like to feel a couple of landmarks. They feel the, the, ASI, the ASIS, the little front bony parts. And they also yeah. try to feel the PSIS. And they think, well, if I can line these up, I've leveled the pelvis. Well, that ignores the human variation in the ilium. Some people have huge iliums. They stick way up there. And you notice the difference between our lowest rib and the top of their hip. There's very tiny room there. That's why they can't side bend very much. Other people have very short or low iliac crests. And they got lots of room for side bending in the hips or doing a you know half moon, standing half moon, because the ribs are quite far away from that. But just mm. by touching these bony points, you can't tell what's going on there. You need an x-ray really to figure that out. So anyone who can think that just by looking at somebody, I can tell whether your hips are, are anterior tilted or posterior tilted, you don't know. Even the therapist to go and spend a lot of time, oh, you've got a torso that's, um, sorry, a sacrum that's tor torsioned. They like to think that, the sacrum itself is flipped out of alignment like this. Yeah. And they can tell by mm -hmm. feeling the posterior, superior iliac spine. Well, when you actually look at the variations, this bone on the left is not the same as the bone on the right. This one might be a whole two centimeters higher than this one, which means it's PSIS is gonna be higher. And that doesn't mean the sacrum is tilted. It's just one bone is different than the X. So all these little aesthetic cues that people rely on, they're not very reliable. So what's the answer then? I mean, when, when you talk about cues such as um, anterior, posterior, tilt in a forward fold, um, and someone has a natural propensity, for example, for uh, you know an anterior tilt of the pelvis, I mean, are you trying to cue them differently and change their body? You know, or is there more effective and less effective range of movement there? How would how would you? Let me back up a bit someone? first. Yeah. If you're taking a functional approach to yoga, a functional mm. approach requires that you have an intention for the pose. Like, why mm. did you ask them to do a forward fold in the first place? Right. Now, that intention mm -hmm. can be to create a stress in a targeted area. Like mm -hmm. the reason I'm asking you to do a forward fold is I want to put a tension into the back of the body. Mm -hmm. So now I put somebody into a forward fold and I go up and ask, what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Fine. How are you? No, but what are you feeling? And once I can get them to say, okay, yeah, I'm feeling a tension in the back of the body. I don't care what the pelvis is doing. That's right. aesthetics. If they're mm. getting the intention of the pose, leave them alone. Mm. If they're not getting the intention of the pose, they say, I don't, I'm feeling all my back. Okay, well, maybe it's because your hamstring is really tight, it's coming to your back. Let's try bending the knees and see if we can let the back be more neutral. Now get forward with the knees really bent. Now just try to straighten the knees a bit. Now are you feeling it? Oh yeah, now I'm feeling the legs a bit. Mm. It's still not an aesthetic. You're just trying different variations of the pose to get the sensation in the targeted area. Mm. Mm. How, how does this, any of this relate to yoga on a deeper level? Like, I mean, I know that you talk about having, you know, as much as you're an anatomist, having, um, you know, still having an interest mm -hmm. in yoga as a spiritual, um, you know, endeavor, whatever that means. Has it, has it, you know, on a personal level, has, has any of this impacted your feelings about what you're doing at all on a deeper, you know, oh, a non bodily level? Right. Okay. Yeah, because when I first started doing yoga, I was worried about where my body was. It was all about where should my hands be? Where should my feet be? Should my front heel be lined up with the arch of the back foot or with the back right. heel and warrior two? And it was always about this aesthetic, where should things be? Mm. Once I met Paul Grilly and started to realize these aesthetics aren't the same for everybody, mm. I started to realize, well, what I should be doing is figuring out what's happening inside me. That's what really started me to come inward and feeling my body. That's what mm. helped me build interoception. So I think this whole focus on a functional approach to yoga helped to deepen my practice more because now I started to pay attention to what's going on inside. 
You yeah. think of those the kosha model of the body. There's mm, the anamaya kosha, mm, the, the food sheath, and then the more yeah. subtle is the pranamaya kosha. Well, I started to realize from Deskachar and a few other teachers that really it should start from the core and work outwards. So your energy body will tell you where the physical body should be. If you experiment with, say, a pulsating warrior two, you come into warrior two and you just block it out like, a, like an artist doing a painting. They don't do the details right away. They just block out the whole picture and then they mm. refine it and then they refine it. So you, you come into a warrior two and you pulsate in and out. And with each pulsation, you try to figure out, well, where is the easiest way to be? Where is the energy mm. free to flow? And after mm. four or five pulses, I'm feeling safe, secure, solid, grounded. Not stiff and rigid, but and then I look and where my body is, and that's the alignment for my body because that's what the energy kind of shaped. That's what sculpted me into it. So for me, this functional approach to yoga helped to deepen my my feeling of the yoga practice much more than the aesthetic approach was doing. Mm. It's kind of ironic in a way. And, and just one last question, as I've got here, what about you mentioned the pulsing yeah. of the stretching, and I wanted to ask you. And you, you know, at the start of our our chat, you also mentioned staying longer in a posture and and having further release from that. I know that most of our listeners will be Ashtanga practitioners. Now, you want to say anything about I mean, ways of stretching? I think in your book you also mentioned the bouncing idea of the eighties. Remember that idea that you could kind of bounce yeah, and, and come back. Yeah, yeah. Have you had any kind of uh, ideas about the you know because uh, often the narrative in Ashtanga yoga is stay still as you can, you know, or um, so right. this idea that you wouldn't move in a stretch. Yeah, There's one. even and in last. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to finish and, and say. Um, God, I can't remember. It's gone out of my head now. Oh, oh yes. And is there any benefit in, in staying a, only a short amount of time? Because obviously Ashtanga is incredibly short periods of time, right? So would there ever be a yeah. benefit of, of staying only five breaths, for example, as opposed to five minutes? Yeah. And that, yeah. It's all good. Right. It's all good. You know, Ashtanga is going to work to strengthen the muscles and increase range of motion. As I said, I've done Ashtanga for many, many years. I did it for three years before finding yin yoga, but I also did it for several years after yin yoga. And I found mm. yin helped to improve my range of motion faster than ashtanga. But yin doesn't make the muscles stronger, doesn't build up mm. a good sweat, doesn't, there's no cardiovascular effort to it. So there's benefits to all of this. Mm. When you're holding for like a minute, you will get some stretching benefits. And that's going to be more of a muscular level, I think. And when you're doing the yang version, you're going to get more of a release into the fascial tissues, like the ligaments, the joint capsules, the tendons and the water nature is also going to change and more time to relax the nervous system interaction. So you'll gain more range of motion through the in practice than the Ashtanga practice. But that's not to say Ashtanga isn't going to open you up. It will, mm. but it'll also give you the other benefits, the heart benefits and the muscle benefits. The bouncing part, some of the new research in fascia is showing, as I mentioned, fascias are, are springs. And you can tone the springiness of our springs through bouncing. So mm. pylometrics, which is the term for it now, has come back and there's different little bouncy things. And if you want to learn more about it, the expert in this is a guy named Dr. Robert Schleip at the University of Ulm in Germany. And he's got a book called Fascial Fitness. And in there, he's got a number of different bouncing techniques, skipping rope, uh, just doing a push up against the wall and bouncing off. And you only mm. have to do this for like five minutes, twice a week. That's all it takes to reprogram the bounciness of your springs. Oh, wow. So do that. Do Ashtanga, do Yin. In my view, physical fitness really has three components. There's mm. strength, endurance, and mobility. Mm. Now, for strength, I found in my Ashtanga practice, I kind of plateaued. I wasn't getting any stronger. Once you can do handstands, mm. you're, you're already working with your body weight. So now I, I'm swinging kettlebells. That's, mm. You need resistance training. For endurance, when I first started Ashtanga, it kicked my butt. I, I, was, I couldn't believe how hard it was. After three years, yeah, it still got a good sweat, but it wasn't that hard. Again, I plateaued. So now I have to run sprints or climb stairs or ride a bike. I need to get other things to really get my heart rate up. And then for mm. mobility, well, I found yin yoga is the best for that. So mm. I think you need all three. And all three can mm. be part of your yoga. Yoga is not mm. what you do. Yoga is how you do what you do. To borrow mm. a phrase from Brian Kest. So you can lift weights and still do yoga. Just mm. Where's your attention? How's your mindfulness? What's your breath like? You can still do yoga while you're running. Again, where's your intention? Mm. What's your breath like? Mm. So it's all good. 
finally to end up, I'm going to ask you something different today. Why do you think there's such a propensity or, or preponderancy of hip mobility stretches and yoga then? Is there any particular reason you can see why it's all lotus, where there's so much focus on this area of the body and this particular range of motion? It's more so in Ashtanga, I think, than other right. styles because Ashtanga has the seated postures. Mm. Whereas other, even vinyasa flow, it's more standing work and then lie down and take a rest. Then there will still be some seated postures, but I don't think there's mm. as much as in Ashtanga. Mm. It's cool. It looks cool. It looks good. And it's not to say that it's always going to be a problem. I think it's always going to be a problem if you try to go too far and try mm. to get more than what your body will give you. But let's not over worry about that too. I know there was a time, yes, maybe 10 years ago now, where someone wrote an article saying that, look at all these senior yoga teachers are getting hip replacements. And this article listed about five of them. So I thought, well, yes. wait a sec, that, you know, for my science background, correlation is not causation. Just because mm. a lot of these senior yoga teachers are getting hip replacement didn't mean yoga caused it. So I mm. called them up, I got a hold of them. And I remember one, Beryl Bender Birch, she said, oh, I'm so angry about that article. You know, I had a really bad accident when I was a teenager and yoga saved my hips. I didn't have to have a hip replacement for 20 years, thanks to yoga. But finally, I had to get them replaced. So it wasn't because mm. of yoga I had to replace my hips, but it was just these other factors. And when I talked to the other four people, they all had a very similar story. In their view, yoga didn't cause their hip problems. Yoga actually helped them keep their hips longer than they otherwise would have. So right. be that's careful of correlation and causation. Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of nice note to end on. Um, what, what was the article, by the way? Do you remember then? Is it still possible to find it? Uh, it was by Michelle Edwards, and huh. he's okay. in Hawaii. Um, I don't remember the name of the article itself, okay. but it's contentious. Yeah. I agree yeah. that uh, yes. there is yeah. something called FAI, and in my book I talk about FAI, which is femoral femur acetabular impingement syndrome, and that's a real thing. And if you keep doing that, you could tear your labrum, but that almost always happens with internal rotation added to flexion. And you see there, that is when these two bones hit most often. And a lot of people naturally stand with their feet turning outward because of something called tibial torsion. And for us in yoga, we like our feet parallel. So we have everyone internally rotate at the hip socket. Then we add the forward folds. And that mm. can cause FIIS, from the femur acetabular impingement syndrome. So yes, that is a real fear but only if you get into this aesthetic that the feet must be pointing straight ahead. If you figure out my airplane, the feet are pointing outward, and that's the neutral position for my femur and my hip socket, then you're not gonna get it because there's no way the bones are gonna hit. It's only if you try to do these two movements together and you'll feel this pinching here, oh, it hurts, but you keep doing it, don't do it. Figure <laughs> out where the neutral position of your foot is and then right. do your hip flexion with that. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, there's a whole other conversation there, but I, I realize I've taken up a lot of your time. So I just want to tell, uh, tell you from everyone, I think, thank you so much for your time, Bernie. And where can people find you? Um, I know that you've got the books and I want to say again that the books are fantastic and I'm going to read all of them. And it might take me some time, but I'm, you know, I'm f halfway through the first one and I'm going to persevere to read all of them. Um, and where else? Have you got a website and are you teaching in person yeah, at all? Basically, yinyoga.com. Yinyoga.com is my website. And my books and my teachings and all that are there. Just a final note on the book. Think, think of these like textbooks. You wouldn't want to read a textbook from cover to cover. So you can kind of glance through the first one, read the sidebars. And then if you want to dive into one particular area, like the hips, I really want to know the hips, then go ahead and, and enjoy that part. But don't try to memorize the whole thing. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> off the hook <laughs> all right so are you, are you teaching Indeed. a person at all for people you know i know you're in vancouver i didn't mention you bernie's living in vancouver where we used to live um lovely part of the world yeah. are you teaching there or are you are you traveling at all i'm not teaching public classes anymore that died out okay. with the pandemic i did okay. switch to online teacher trainings but we're going to have two in-person teacher trainings this year so okay. we're kind of going back into that but I don't travel to teach, so I'm always here in Vancouver. Right, so you'll be in Vancouver doing these trainings. Well, if anyone, well, if I get yeah. over, then I, <laughs> I will certainly look yeah, you up. Stop thank by. You. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for your time, man. It's been fantastic uh, chat. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. It was fun. Thank you. <laughs>